Episode 214, Pig Tractor and Silver Pasture. This is the World Organic News for the week ending 18th of May 2020. John Moore reporting. Decarbonise the air, recarbonise the soil. Uh, This week we've been flat out planting garlic, so I'm bringing you an episode from the Permaculture Plus podcast I was on back in early 2019, covering the subjects of pig tractors and silver pasture. Uh, We'll be back to more up-to-date episodes next week. So without further ado, here is Pig Tractors and Silver Pasture on the Permaculture Plus podcast. Folks and welcome to episode five of Permaculture Plus, our first episode for 2019, and we've devoted this show to the unlikely combination of topics of pig tractors and a revived Back to the Future agroforestry method called silver pasture. Co-host, friend, author, and podcaster at World Organic News, John Moore, is champing at the bit to tell you all about these in the High Clare Studios in Northwestern Tasmania. And he'll be joining us in a moment, but first I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you who have taken the time to subscribe to the podcast. John and I really appreciate your support, and please let your friends know where we are on Permaculture Plus on Apple Podcasts or on the podcatcher of your choice. Now, as regular listeners will know, One of our main aims at Permaculture Plus is to reintroduce or introduce ideas based on, but not limited to, permaculture ideas. As such, we focus each episode on one or more of the permaculture principles and ethics. Now, to frame this week's episode, we've chosen the principles number five, use and value renewable resources and services, and six, produce no waste. First, we'll talk about the concept of pig tractors, how they fit into a permaculture, organic-style small farm system and more. Are you there, John? Yes. Hello, Rich. Hello, listeners. Okay, John. First, for those people like myself who've only got a passing knowledge of farming systems, can you describe what a pig tractor is and how it works within an organic food growing system? Yeah, sure. Um, I first came across this sort of thing when I was reading John Seymour. Mm. book of uh complete book of self-sufficiency back in the 70s yeah came out about the same time as the good life <laughs> and in the uh, book permaculture people put out in the 90s mm-hmm. there was a whole section there on a fella in hawaii who just has all these little pens that he runs his pigs through yeah limes the ground grows stuff for them mm-hmm. and they just move on and his output is pig meat but basically a pig is a shovel at the front end, a manure spreader at the back, and a bacon factory in the middle. Beautifully put. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, that's, I can't claim that one. I, I read that somewhere. Oh, okay. <laughs> so basically what we're doing is using the pigs to renovate the pasture. Yep. Overgrowing in places. There's an odd mix of things. There's lots of, yeah, I suppose you'd call them weeds, but I'd be happy enough with them if I had a stronger pasture that could you could deal with it. So we're using them to renovate the pastures, sort of 500 square metres at a time. I've split it up into 20 by 25 metre blocks, Mm -hmm. and we'll fence that with electric fencing, and then uh, we're getting three piglets to start with, and so they'll they'll grow as they do. So they'll get through more land more quickly as they get bigger. Yeah. But they will turn over the whole place. That's Um, amazing. Yeah, you know, it it sort of goes against the do not dig. Mm. But it's a necessary step, I think, in bringing the pastures back to what they should be because there's a clay pan underneath. So I'm going sort of two or three of the, the little plots ahead of them. Yeah. I'll be sowing dacon radishes to break up the, the clay pan and feed the pigs when they get there. So as they prepare each bed and then move them on, mm. I'll, I'll lime it and it'll either be used for a new pasture or grain or vegetables or fruit trees or all of the above. I must have been... You go on. Sorry, Joe. I was going to say, I must admit, I have heard of chicken tractors, and a friend of mine does use them just on her small permaculture backyard. Would you use pig tractors and chicken tractors in conjunction with each other? Or? Yeah, you, you, you use the chooks to follow up on, uh, uh, yeah. uh, after the pigs had gone because the pigs will eat them. 
Mm. But also because if you look at nature, birds follow, well, herbivores particularly on the savannas and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And on the, the, the prairies of North America. And they, they spread the muck about. Uh, but with the nature of pigs, it's, I'll just rake it. It's, you know, only 500 square metres. Mm. And maybe let the geese run across it afterwards or, or the chooks. We'll just see how it goes. I haven't got it set in my head yet, but I've got an idea of a, a succession. But we'll okay. see what happens, and it's about you know staying observant and see what happens. Okay, and we look forward to hearing more about that. Mm. Okay, John, as mentioned at the top of the show, we've wrapped this episode of Permaculture Plus around the principles use and value renewable resources and services and produce no waste. Just wondering how you would fit a pig tractor into these principles. Well, if we start with the housing and the watering, basically everything that they'll be living in and drinking from, I've cobbled together mm. from stuff that was lying around. Right, yeah. Uh, the only thing I had to buy was a, a watering nipple, which is a little thing they clamp down on and the water eases out of. Okay. Yeah, they take to it fairly quickly apparently, according to YouTube, and if they have trouble finding it, we'll just smear it with peanut butter okay. and that, that'll get them <laughs> onto it. Um, so renewable resources, we're just basically using the embedded energy and the things mm. that are already here, corrugated yep. iron and the timber and whatnot. Mm. And the soil, of course, is the ultimate renewable resource. So what we'll be doing is using the soil to generate more feed for pigs later or a commercial crop or whatever for ourselves. But the pasture doesn't go you know, like the, the soil doesn't go anywhere and the sun's still going to shine. Mm-hmm. So, and the idea of Bill Mollison, I think, said that waste is just a resource in the wrong place. Mm. So rather than put pigs in a shed and then shovel the poo and take it off to where we need it and compost it and then put it on the soil, yes, we're just using the pigs to put the resource where I want it, mm-hmm. as nature intended in a lot of ways. And it, it's 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 a self sustaining system, I suspect. Uh, and it saves you a lot of time and effort too, doesn't it, John? Use the animals to do the work, yeah. Exactly. You know, and they good get point. to express their isness, you know, their pigness. Their pigness. Yeah. <laughs> good, good point. Just on the pig manure, John, is it, is it a rich sort of manure? It's a yeah. beneficial, say, for the, the vegetable garden? Yeah, yeah, it's nowhere near as hot as chicken manure. Mm-hmm. And it, it was always prized amongst small holders, apparently, from what yep. I understand, and crofters in... Uh, the Scottish Highlands. So, yeah, no, it's good stuff. And it being incorporated into the soil by the pigs, it'll be partially decomposed by planting time and we'll just adjust as we go. Okay. And for anyone who's got a small holding farm thinking of introducing pig tractors, what breed would you recommend, John? Well, basically anything that's not raised in a factory farm. Yep. There were, there were many more breeds, but a lot of them have died out because of the, the obsession with putting things in boxes mm. and force feeding them. But you can still get saddlebacks and barkshires and large blacks and whites here in Australia. Uh, Tamworths as well is another good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tamworths were especially bred for it. They're a long, lean, brown, gingery sort of thing. And any of the crosses of the above, I know in... I think in Europe, uh, the UK and Ireland and places, you can still get the Gloucester Old Spot, yeah. which is uh, an orchard pig. Right. But crosses of any of those are also good as well as the, the, the pure breed. They, they grow slower than if you put them in a factory, but I'm not in a hurry. Yeah, sounds fascinating, John. Thank mm. you very much for that information. And if any listeners are running small farms and you may want to consider big tractors as part of it, and I know... John will be following this topic closely on his podcast, World Organic News, so I suggest you might want to tune in there. And it might be appropriate now just to end this section of the show with a famous quote by Winston Churchill, and it's one of my favourites, John. It is, quote, I like pigs, dogs look up to us, cats look down on us, pigs treat us as equals, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> he knew his way around a good <laughs> quote, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you had to be good at something, yeah. <laughs> and we're just going to head into a short break and then we'll be back with our topic of interest for the month and it is a beauty, folks. It's silver pasture. More in a moment. Interested in permaculture? Or to be more precise, are you interested in how permaculture can improve aspects of your everyday life? Co-hosts Rich Bowden and John Moore invite you to listen to Permaculture Plus 
to find this out for yourselves. And a hint, it's more than just growing things. That's Permaculture Plus in your podcast, The Feed of Choice, on the 15th of every month. Hi, I'm John Moore, producer of the World Organic News Podcast. I report on stories and ideas that fit with the show's catchphrase. Decarbonise the air and recarbonise the soil. So I cover everything from alternative energy to regenerative agriculture. A new episode releases each Monday morning and the show is approaching the end of its third year. So please, join me and together we can change the world. Okay, now the next part of the show was inspired by my regular reading of Drawdown, which is one of my favourite books of 2018. It's edited by author, speaker and environment activist Paul Hawken. I thoroughly recommend this book, listeners, and we'll have a link to where you can buy it in the show notes. It's played a very important part in inspiring not just Permaculture Plus, but also my very good friend Mark Spencer's climate change podcast, Climactic. Uh, That's where I help out a little bit. Now, the book itemises and perhaps more importantly quantifies the simple methods needed to draw down carbon from the atmosphere, hence the name. And food growing occupies a number of of the higher positions. And number nine on the list is the ancient practice of silver pasture. According to the book Drawdown, silver pasture is defined as, quote, the addition of trees to pastures for increased productivity and biosequestration. This solution replaces conventional livestock grazing on pasture and rangeland, end quote. And indeed, silvo comes from the Latin word for forest or woodland. John, can you go into silver pasture just a little bit more for us, please? Okay, yeah, it, again, it's a part of biomimicry. Mm. I don't know if people remember their high school biology, but there was a thing called vegetative succession, particularly for the Northern Hemisphere where there were uh, glaciers. Yes. And as the glaciers pulled back, there was bare soil, and then you got mm. what we now call weeds. Yep. And pasture, then shrubs and things like hazelnuts and what we have, uh, acacias here after a bushfire sort of thing. Yeah. Same yeah. sort of conditions. And so it slowly builds. Sort of like pioneer plants, isn't that right? Yeah, to, they to, are, to, yeah. to repair the earth, yeah. Yeah, and they, uh, they suck the nitrogen that the, the acacias do here. Mm-hmm. Um, but also they, they hold the soil and keep it together. Like the same way blackberries hold nutrients above the soil and below it and stop it moving. Uh, eventually, the vegetative succession leads to forestry and eventually to peat bogs mm-hmm. as the forests fall into them. So basically what silver pasture is doing is trying to match that point where there's uh, trees and shrubs and pasture, what used to yeah. be called parkland in the 19th, 18th and 19th century. Yes. That the, um, the aristocracy had, so the, like the, the, the big parklands across the UK, so that they'd bring sheep in and out. To, to maintain the beauty, for want of a better mm-hmm. word, of the place. Mm-hmm. But there's been a lot of work done. Uh, food and Agriculture Organisation did, one, did a, a particular piece on combining cattle, pasture and coconuts, which I found in really intriguing. Some very interesting stuff there, even if you, you change the species, yeah, which is sort of what we're doing. So it's a matter of matching then the stock to the age of the trees. Mm-hmm. You can use electric fencing to do that. John Seymour again, mentioned it back in the 70s, he called it 3D farming, so that you're getting food from above the ground as well as along the the surface of the earth. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the past I've run sheep under orchards and used the windfalls to give them a bit of a boost before mating and then we ended up with lots of twins. Yeah. So it's, it's not that difficult and you can get lots of different outputs from both the, the stock and the trees. Mm-hmm. Now, clearly, goats don't do well in this sort of situation because they'll just ring bark everything. Right. But sheep and cattle, uh, they can they work. Um, there's also sheep I've seen. A friend of ours is setting up a vineyard in the northwest of the US mm-hmm. where they're going to run south down sheep, which are being sold as baby doll sheep nowadays. Yeah, yeah. But they're, they're short-legged, broad little things, so they fit underneath the, the vines. Similar sort of thing happened when I was in Ireland. Uh, we were collecting the windfalls and taking them to the stock. 
Whereas with silver pasture, the idea is to actually use the stock to collect the feed that comes from the trees in situ, so you don't actually have to cart stuff about. Okay. But the the calves knew, and they used to almost knock you over when they saw you come on with a wheelbarrow full of chopped mm-hmm. up apples. I think that probably explains it a little bit. It's about having a structure, a three D structure, basically. Just so, does. Yeah, yeah that, that's really interesting, John. It does seem to me just a little bit like, you know, the permaculture style, old-fashioned common sense thinking, mm. uh, just relating it to farming. Mm. Uh, and just a reminder to listeners that that's exactly what we're trying to do at uh, Permaculture Plus. Uh, do you agree with that, John? Is that Does that sort of come across the same to you? Yeah, of course. It's, um, the mm. problem is, since the Second World War and the industrialisation of farming, the animal agriculture and, and plant agriculture has been ripped apart. Yeah. So you've got pigs in sheds, chooks in sheds, just inhumane conditions. Mm. And, you know, cattle in cattle in feedlots and cafes and things. Yeah. And the, the, and on the other side, you've got things like BT coin and soya beans. It like just wouldn't run stock through. But by adding layers of complexity, makes the system more stable, which right. is quite bizarre in a lot of ways. It's the opposite of what you'd expect. Yeah. But it actually builds in layers of safety nets. So I know people that use sheep to, to clean up their, their wheat if they've had a dry year and it, it hasn't grown enough to actually bother harvesting. Mm. And they run them within hedgerows of salt bush, which is the first sort of step along the way. They're another sort of pioneer species. You can use the salt bush is great for that, as is a lot of tagasasti, mm-hmm. things like that. So they're... I think it's important to think about these things, and I'm sure in the in the the deep dark past, there was no separation between like pigs used to be run through communal forests, yeah, to collect the acorns and whatnot, and and feed people over winter. But it's that obsession with monoculture and separating each item out, yes, and expanding it to points beyond you know, negative returns. Points of diminishing return that, that's got things so complex and basically poured so much carbon into the air. Yeah, and silver past is a great way to draw down carbon and, and keep it where it's needed in the soil and in the trees. How do you see it, John? With uh, we t- you, we mentioned earlier about pig tractors, but as far as the permaculture principles number five, use and value renewable resources and services, and six, produce no waste. Do you see a correlation here as well? Yeah, yeah. It's, again, it's about using what's available in your landscape, mm. but also you, the trees are fruiting every year, for want of a better word, or for centuries sometimes with apples and oak and whatnot. Now, some you'll know, you might want to cut for timber, but that's a renewable resource because you can replace it with other trees. It's it's almost a no-brainer. Mm. It, but getting, getting, I saw a Four Corners, no, Landline maybe. Actually, I think it was Countrywide it was that long ago. Yeah. And this fella, in certain parts of Queensland, they used to put giant chain between two bulldozers and just strip the, the scrub out, Yeah. burn it, and then run cattle on it. And this bloke said, nah, that's no good, and just did much smaller clearings. Mm. And left larger parts of scrub. And he said, you know, there was a drought then in the 70s, 80s, I can't remember which. There's a drought all the time, obviously. Yeah. But he had water. And so his neighbours had come to him and say, how do you do it? He'd say, you don't clear as much. Yeah. And they'd just scratch their heads because this is the way they'd done it for so long. Mm. And so it's a banner of mindset shift as well. And the the farms are on the front line of climate change. They can see it day to day, season to season. So uh, it's getting easier to convince people of the need to change. It just depends on their debt levels, basically. Mm -hmm. And, of course, with the the silver pasture, everything's interconnected. So each unit, for want of a better phrase, cattle or trees or pasture or hedgerows, feeds the next one. So... You've got fruit coming off the trees to feed the stock. The stock are manuring the paddocks. The, the manure, the, the the nutrients are going into the tree lines. Uh, the the hedgerows are giving cover for birds so that they can eat the the nasties. Mm. It's just and the more complexity you can get into it, the more self sustaining it is. Thank you very much, John. There's another excellent answer. 
Okay, my good friend Mark Spencer, who I mentioned before, will be very interested in the fact that the drawdown team has estimated that silver pasture is currently practised on 351 million acres throughout the world. Now, according to them, if this was increased to 554 million acres, 31.2 gigatons less carbon emissions will be emitted with nearly US $700 billion savings. And this is according to the scientists of Drawdown. Now, John, these are amazing figures. Uh, no wonder it's as high as number nine on Drawdown's list of methods to reduce carbon emissions. Do you see this as being the next big thing? Well, one would hope so. Uh, there was a woman on Four Corners talking about this sort of thing 20 years ago. You know, it's, it's, it'll be an overnight success after 20 years. You know? Yes. <laughs> it, it's, it's a variation on regenerative agriculture, obviously, yes. and it is somewhat locale-specific. Uh, you don't want to sort of... Um, floodplains are used for other things, bottom land is used for grain and, and the hills for uh, olive orchards and things like they were in uh, the ancient Mediterranean. But there was still stock under the orchard. Tree, yeah. uh, and the olive trees and the orchards and whatnot. And it is so, silver pasture is quite location specific, but it it's doable most places. And a variation of regenerative agriculture is doable everywhere. Mm. And it, it means basically a mind shift from farmers seeing themselves as tamers of nature to systems managers. I remember yes. hearing a bloke, he might have been, I can't even remember where it was now, he said his grandfather fought nature, mm. his father begrudgingly accepted nature, and, mm. and he was trying to work with her. Sounds a lot like Charles, Charles Massey, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> same sort of, and, and he goes back generations there too. Yeah. It's, yeah. But it's that sort of change that, that's happening anyway because people can see the futility of trying to fight nature. And with, you get more carbon held in the trees and in the shrubs as well as the soil, yeah. and it's the soil that matters. Yeah. And I think if, John, am I right in saying that if you are looking at setting up a silver pasture system that you really need to go around and look at what grows in the way of woodland, forest, bush, scrub that, uh, in your area? It's no use really introducing species, would that be correct? Uh, yes and no. I mean, you've still got to make a living. Mm -hmm. A lot of the silver pasture stuff is, is forestry and, and stock together. But I suspect that you could actually work food production into it as well, food producing trees yeah. as well. And so that you take the, the, the cream of the crop for, for sale to other people mm. and all the misshapen apples and whatnot go through the stock. But if you're going to do it for timber, you'd need to look at what grows well locally. Mm. But then a lot we, we've messed around with the we've messed around with the ecology so much since you know, white folk got here. Mm. that it's not going to – you're never going to get it back to what it was. I mean, humans yeah. change landscapes, uh, all yes. humans. Yep. You know, the, the landscape that uh, the first settler, white settlers found here had been altered by Aboriginal culture for however many hundreds of, you know, 60, 70, 80,000 years yep. beforehand because there were people on it. It's just an extra, uh, an extra species in the landscape, mm. and that's what we are as well, obviously. So I'm not opposed to sticking with local stuff, but equally I'm not opposed to using whatever works. Yeah. It's yeah. probably getting to the point now where it's more important to get the systems up and running and carbon being sucked out of the air and into the soil than it is to be purist about, oh, that tree didn't grow here, it grew 20, 20 mile down the road. Absolutely, yeah. You know? and, yeah. And things are moving anyway as the climate warms. The, the tree line in northern Canada is getting further north now because it's warm enough and the tundra is retreating. So mm, mm. change is upon us. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a very interesting point you make about uh, particularly Australian soil, John. And uh, the final question I'll put to you yep. is that uh, groundbreaking regenerative agriculturalists such as Charles Massey, who's the author of The Call of the Reed Warbler, mm. have spoken highly of silver pasture techniques pointing to the destruction of the Europe, European style pasture grazing has wreaked on the Australian landscape. And we, you were talking about that just then, John. Uh, Australia with its thin soils and water yeah. shortages. 
And how do you respond? Will silver pasture help Australian graziers repair the soils to a certain extent? Well, it can be done. Um, mm. When I was down on the Monero, which is where uh, Charles Massey's from, we had a profile in the creek. Uh, I was studying archaeology at the time, so I was able to read the stratigraphy. And you could see where the old soil, the old topsoil was. It was a rich, black, glorious mm. thing. Yeah. Only sort of four to six inches thick, but, oh, it was lovely. Yeah. And then above that, there was a layer of ridden with charcoal where the land had been cleared and burnt. Mm-hmm. And then above that was about, and that bit varied, so sort of two inches, five centimetres, up to about ten centimetres, so two to four inches. Mm. But over the top of it was something like up to between 15 and 45 centimetres of grey, horrible, decomposed granite on a lot of levels that had just fallen off the hills as yeah. the, the soil that the vegetation was removed. And it was still continuing to move because I walked up the hills to see just to confirm that what I'd seen on the, the profile was actually happening. Mm. And, you know, the more droughts, the more that happens because there's nothing holding the soil. Yes. Whereas if you've got hedgerows of timber trees or fruit trees or a combination of the two along contours, you will at least trap the soil up there and slow its movement. Yeah. And give it a chance to, to regenerate. So, yeah, I think it will help, mm. yeah, even if you just do hedgerows of salt bush. I'm thinking too, John, just to a point that you make there, we, uh, here in the central western New South Wales we're getting a lot of dust storms and uh, people are saying that it uh, is coming from the north. Uh, obviously it's the drought yep. uh, uh, and the uh, the topsoil is just being you know, blown straight up in the air with uh, with winds and it's coming down. Uh, apparently it's, you know, it's it, it's been quite nasty. We've had quite a few bad dust storms and... Yep. Uh, I'm thinking this sort of silver pasture, as you were just pointing out then, if there were hedgerows, if there were woodland, that sort of thing, it would hold the soil better. Am I right in thinking that? Yeah, and the Americans had the same problem in the Depression with the Dust Bowl. Yes. And they reversed it by planting and Mm. keeping the soil covered. It's something we all seem to have forgotten. Uh, I know what you mean about the dust storms when we were driving down to get on the ferry to, to come to Tassie. There was horrible muck all the, yeah. all the way down until well, just before Gundagai, I guess. Yes. But all of a sudden it just stopped and we were out of yep. it. But, yep. yeah, it's it almost makes you cry to see that much because we don't have a lot of topsoil in this country. <laughs> no, you're right. Yeah. Mind you, it's got to land somewhere, hasn't it, John? <laughs> yeah, there's an awful lot of ocean out there too, Rich. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. absolutely right. Look, uh, this has been fascinating. I've really enjoyed this, and I always know when I've done something good because I, I learn something in the episode, and I've done that this this time. Thank you very much to friend and co-host John Moore for your contribution to my learning process, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as me. Okay, everyone, bye for this month. Yep, and all the links will be in the show notes, folks, and yes, I really enjoyed this one too. Bye. <laughs>